Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. It's still morning. We'll see if it's still morning when I'm finished with my sermon. If it's not morning when I'm finished with my sermon, you will be morning. Is that? You can be turning to Matthew chapter 6. As I was preparing, I, I was thinking of some of the dangers that we face. And I. When I was in high school, many eons ago, the, the big warning was, in fact, even before I was in high school, back when I was in elementary school, the big danger everybody was being warned about was global cooling. Ice age. We were going to plunge humanity into a new ice age, and we were in trouble. And we needed to change our behavior quickly. We, you know, the danger was all over the place. That sort of didn't work out, and that didn't, maybe we solved it. I don't know. The next thing was acid rain. We were going, it, it would be dangerous to eventually go outside. All our structures would be destroyed by the acid falling from the sky. And apparently we solved that as well. CFCs, there's, we were going to rip a hole in the ozone so large that UV would just come in and we would be, we would be turned into crispy critters. It would have just been awesome in the wrong way. Now we're, the next thing was global warming. You know, we, we need to, whatever you're doing, stop doing it because that's causing the earth to get really hot so stop behaving and of course now we've because I think by 2012 just a warning there by 2012 most of Florida will be underwater just to give you that warning by the way all these dangers tend to be like 10 12 years out it's just it, it is very characteristic and then now we're just in global change. Either the weather's going to be hotter or colder, or it's going to be wetter or drier, but it's going to change, and whatever the change is, it's going to be worse than what it is right now. There's a lot of dangers that people are warning us about. And there can be a distraction because we look at the warning, and the thing I noticed, I've noticed with it is a lot of those dangers are always aimed especially at people in high school and younger because they haven't been through the series of danger danger and there's a reason why we get warnings there's warnings that are given to realize we're on a bad course the other day i was driving into work and it's a warning that I appreciated. Not at the moment, but I'm really glad that I had the warning. I was on 684, I was passing Central, and I was being a little bit distracted by the people going extremely slow in the left-hand lane. And I, you know, there's a little bit of frustration there. And then sudden frustration happened when this big blinking light came on my dash and it said, oh, engine exceeding heat. And I'm like, oh no, what's going on? And then suddenly I started smelling the antifreeze. I'll, I'll tell you the, the rest of the story before I go on where you're not wondering and distracted for the whole sermon. Basically, uh, one of the hoses exploded. And so no radiator uh, no antifreeze in the radiator, so that's apparently an issue. I'm not a mechanic, but Dan concurs. 
got to work, told the the uh, mechanic manager at at work what happened. He came out. I doubt I can fix it, but we'll go out there and look at it. Fortunately, it was where it goes into the engine, right in not the where it goes into the heater. It blew out right there. Cut it off, put it back on, good as new. No towing, anything like that. I was very happy. But I was very glad for that warning. Now, eventually I would have smelled the antifreeze and figured something was wrong, but I appreciated that warning. So there's bad warnings and there are good, good warnings. We have a very important warning here. And it's not a warning that we'd say, well, this is a big dangerous. It's not something I, I really need to be cautious of, but it's a, it is a legitimate danger that has incredible destructive potential in our life. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll look at this warning. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come before you right now. I just want to thank you for your ministering to our life. You give us the true and right warnings that we can live our life in a way that is pleasing and honoring to you and a life that is worth living, a life that is rewarded. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at the warning. Warning starts off in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. So the warning here is not practicing righteousness, but how we practice it. So uh, there's a couple of things I want to think about before we look into this whole concept. But one of the things that we, we need to understand is this idea of practicing your righteousness. Uh, we understand positional righteousness. We, in Jesus Christ, when we put our trust in him, we receive a positional righteousness. I'm going to heaven no matter how poorly or how well I practice my righteousness. That is a great thing to know. And there is positional righteousness. But something that I don't want to gloss over as we look at this warning is righteousness is something to be practiced. We should practice our righteousness. It is an activity. Doing righteous things is important. And this is something that uh, when we look later into Matthew chapter 6, these are things that will be brought out that we'll, we will examine and see things that are righteous things. Nothing incredibly difficult to do, but it's difficult to do in the right way. But it says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. Now, this sounds kind of odd. You know, don't we practice and live righteousness before other people? Isn't that what we do? Do I go just live and become a hermit out in the woods? Uh, that's not what Jesus Christ is talking about. He's talking about there's this incredible dangerousness, uh, danger with how we do things. Now, one other caveat before I look at what Jesus Christ is pinpointing on. Everybody practices righteousness. You mean everybody? Exactly. We live in a day and age where people have standards of righteousness. This will become very important when we look at the next portion of this verse. Everybody has a list of things that are, are things that constitute right behavior. Now, one of the dangers is, is when we divorce it from the Word of God, it becomes incredibly random and based on, as in a case here, what other people think. What I think, what other people think, and we begin practicing righteousness based on that. I'll have more to say on that in just a moment. But it says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. What is it talking about? In order to be seen by them. The, the thing that is a danger, and it's a danger in all people, because it's something inherent in us. It's a danger that we bring with us wherever we go. All cultures, all people, every individual has this danger of becoming man-centered and how they do their righteousness. 
And as believers, in this case, he's looking at those that were in the Jewish society at that time. The Pharisees were really known for it, where, hey, look at me, look how good I am. And they wanted to do things in such a way to impress other people. There are some dangers with that. One of the dangers is you can become very hypocritical in doing things. Because if, I, if I'm going to, let's say, wearing Hawaiian-style shir uh, shirts as a standard of righteousness, uh, I will be wearing the standard uh, Hawaiian shirt. I may hate those, but uh, in secret I'll go home and I'll wear my plaid shirt. You know, uh, Todd, Jim, you know that unrighteous plaid shirt. There is that danger of hypocrisy. And by the way, hypocrisy, a lot of times we look at it and say, how, how could you do that? Hypocrisy, and we see that in our society where people do one thing, uh, they say one thing and do another. It's rife in our society. Our whole society is like that. You know, it's sort of a little tongue-in-cheek talking about dangers that we face, but people that are, oh, we have to stop putting, you know, carbon into the atmosphere. That is danger. This carbon is going to destroy us. And the same people that do that hop on jets and they blast themselves from one side of the globe to the other, lecturing everybody else. And meanwhile, their one trip blows more carbon in the atmosphere than I, I could probably do in my lifetime. And they do that hypocritically. But part of that is the very ailment. You say, that's hypocrisy. They know it's hypocrisy. But that's not what they're going for. By the way, here's another danger with it, is people will begin taking up causes and speaking of, of things that they don't agree with. They, they don't really care about it, but they will stand for it. And it's all designed to hide sinful behavior. And I could give examples, and I'm going to avoid doing that. There's a couple examples I had thought of, but that hypocrisy is a real danger involved with it. God is concerned about our motivation before other people in order to be seen by them. God is not only concerned about proper behavior, he's concerned about why we do it. Now again, I, I would rather someone, when they're, when they're going about their life, treat me properly because they want to be seen as a good person. I'd rather be around that person I'm glad that I'm not being treated poorly. But it does them no good beyond being accepted as a good person or a nice person by other people. The reality, though, is that person can just be full of hate. And I've, I've used this illustration, and I'm actually a little concerned about nice people. There's a difference between nice and kind. Nice people are nice to you because they want you to go, that's a nice person. That's the whole purpose of it. It's this motivation here. Kind people will treat people kind even if they don't deserve it. And kind people will tell you things that, you know, like this morning, it's kind of funny. When I sat down after Muffy and I drove separately and sat down. And, oh, you, you put yourself together decently today. What happened to my husband? And I'm thinking, what do you mean? You picked this all out. You're the one that chose it. Nope, 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 nope. By the way, there's two types of, a little distraction here. There's two types of really foolish men is there's a man that will see his wife and say, are you going to wear that? That's really foolish, uh, someone that would say that. And there's another foolish type of man where if his wife says, are you going to wear that? He's a foolish man if he says, yes, I'm going to wear that. So both, both sides, don't be foolish. We need to be wise. But our motivation for doing things needs to be related to God. That's, we need to live before God. It's incredibly freeing as well. And we'll, again, I'll highlight that more in a moment. Look at the end part. 
It says, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Our reward will be here. People that give and do things. It's, I, I'm always a little dubious about people saying, hey, look at the, the charity that I have. And now there's some, some famous people that will highlight charities because they know that people will bring their attention to it. And I, I don't want to needlessly judge somebody for doing that. Okay, here's this charity. You know, help these people out. Okay, they're using their, their notoriety, their famous persona to help other people. I get that. But there's a lot of people that will give because, hey, think good of me. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm saying. The reality and the big danger here is you get all your rewards if you're living before men. Again, there's also other dangers. If we're practicing what we think makes us right before people, guess who begins determining what the right things are? You can see why our society is swirled around and going the opposite direction of the Word of God. Why? Well, I'll, I'm going to look and see what our culture says is good things. These things are right. And those people will just sidle on over there and they'll go and they'll accept everything the culture says because they want to be known as having the right opinions, the right ideas, and endorsing the right people. Uh, there is a value right now, by the way, when we see our culture disintegrating before our eyes. And that is one of the things is it's much more difficult to practice hypocrisy as a Christian. There's a lot of people that will put on the show and they'll look really good. And I'm trying not to look at anybody where they're, oh. <laughs> I don't know if you ever had this sermon where there's people. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, Becky goes, stop. There is a value at the disintegrating society because when we say, no, that's wrong and that's sinful, it takes some bravery and it takes uh, some risk on our part because people aren't going to go, good job. I'm proud of you. You're an awesome person. But there's a huge danger of practicing our righteousness before people. And that is that that is the sole reward that we have. Now, Jesus Christ continues, and he gives us a how to practice our righteousness. Thus, when you give to the needy, do not video it and post it on TikTok, as the hypocrites do in the streets and in the synagogues. Whoops, that's, that's a little newer translation here. It says that when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. This is an example. People that do things to say, hey, look how good I am. And again, it's amazing if anything, it's like, okay, this is, this is 2,000 years old here. This, this writing is so out of date. Isn't that how... Uh, you have, I, I've seen people that know nothing of the scripture that only probably know a few of out of context verses that want to criticize the scripture and say you're going to trust an old book written way before us brilliant people came along and it's interesting how Christ's words are even more relevant now than they would have been back then you know, by the way, and again, this is a little extra here. With that being said, about the relevancy of the Word of God, there's a lot of people that go out of their way. Let's be relevant. That's not as big a word, buzzword as it had been, but, you know, let's be relevant to our culture. Well, guess what? The Word of God has never stopped being relevant, and we do not need to change it. In fact, a lot of times people that talk about relevancy, oftentimes they're doing the very thing that Jesus Christ is warning them of. So the example, don't do that. That you will be praised by other people. I want to, other people to say, hey, good job. You know, you're a great person. 
Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. There's a further element of danger here, and that is just temporary reward. When we serve the Lord and we do things out of the right motive, we do the right things out of the right motives, there's an eternal aspect to that reward. It's going to reverberate throughout eternity. Isn't that amazing? I'd rather give secretly $20 to someone and help them in need than uh, $2,000 and people pat me on the back. Verse 3, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. Now this sounds really odd. How can I do that? Do I need to have a split personality, you know, one hand doing the other? What is really being expressed here is that when we're doing things that are righteous, and Jesus Christ is just using the example of meeting other people's needs. And he, he's, the idea of the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing is really, again, talking about how we don't do things out of the motivation of what are other people thinking of me while I'm doing this? What it's talking about is as we practice righteousness, it needs to become part of our character and our being. It, I'll give you an example. Now, I, I don't have shoelaces. I'm sorry, so this may not be the best example. But when you slip on your shoes and you're going to tie your shoelaces, you don't, I, I hope, I hope you don't do this. And there's, I'm looking around, you're the, there's, you're the only person, Kelly, that has shoelaces. <laughs> like, maybe this is a horrible illustration. None of us use shoelaces anymore. Okay. But when you go to tie your shoelaces, you don't go, okay, I make one bunny ear, and then the bunny, do you know what I'm talking about? I hope you're not still on that. If so, there might be some issues that you need to have addressed. We don't have to think about how we're going to tie our shoes. If I was to ask you which, which sock did you put on before you put it, you, you don't think of those things. You, you're not calculating how do I do this and how do I work this. Because it's become part of the habits of your life. God is calling for righteousness to become something habitual in our life. Something that is not motivated out of, hey, what do other people think of me? See, there's an incredible danger, and I didn't really focus on this as much. One of the, one of the rewards for doing it before other people is that praise. A lot of times you can do a lot of stuff and nobody goes, oh, wow, look at that. And it can be really disheartening if your goal is to be praised by people. If you want to be seen doing it, you can be crushed. What happens if you're crushed when you go to do something because you didn't get the feedback that you wanted? That activity stops. If our reward and our praise is to be from people, our righteousness will be limited to when we get that reward. So that is a danger. Another danger with it is we suddenly start doing the things that are rewarded. I wasn't going to use this illustration, but I'll, I'll use this illustration. One of the, the worst people that we know in our society today, universally despised, would be, the main, if I name the name, Harvey Weinstein. Anybody not know that name? Movie mogul. He made people's careers. He was very pro, I'll, I'll use the modern vernacular and then I'm going to change it. He's very pro-abortion. He's very woman causes. Yay, go, go, go. He was saying all the right things. He was an evil person. But people praised him for his 
cultural stands. There was people that would take pictures with him and be glad that their pictures were with him. But he, he was the evil person. People that do things will find the cultural. By the way, when we talk about abortion, they really want to call it something else than what it actually is. Killing a child. You know, I, I, and I'm going to digress here for just a second. I'm going to take a rabbit trail, if that's okay. I'm amazed how oftentimes we can, those that are proper and right in their understanding of the worlds can be put on their heels. The world likes to change and use euphemisms for really ugly things. Abortion is killing babies. And that's all it is. We don't need other words for it, and when they use other words for it, if, and it's rare to get in conversations on it and say, the reason why you want to use other words other than that word is because it would be uncomfortable and you would know it's wrong. So when somebody uses a euphemism and changes the name on something, you know they know it's wrong. When you try to justify something, you justify things that are wrong. And that is, that is the case to be. So Harvey Weinstein, just using him as an uh, example, he did things to be praised by people. He chose something that was really ugly and he followed after it because that would be considered right and get praise. That is one of the dangers of being praised by other people. Then, then the standards of the world, the ever-changing and shifting sands of the morality of our society becomes what is right. And it is hard. And it's, it's a good thing that it is hard to stand for what is right when the world is so wrong. Let's go back to the very beginning. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. What we do is right and our behavior that is right needs to be for one person. And that is for the praise and glory that God will say, well done and good, good and faithful servant. When we do that, there's another blessing that's involved. If I follow God's will and I do Christ's righteousness for his glory, everyone around me will be much better off. I'll give you this example and then I'll close. I honestly believe if you, if you own an animal and you are following and worshiping God, that animal is going to have a better life. Just the animal will be better off. Because the Bible says, a righteous man cares for the life of his beast. Even the small things end up benefiting. Animals, but even more importantly, the people around us will live and experience life better because of us practicing our life and our righteousness before God. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. We thank you for your son who came, lived perfectly righteously, and died on the cross in our place. We deserve eternal separation, but we have eternal fellowship through your son. We thank you for the salvation that is only found in him. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.